safe food amid the current pandemic. This is brought to you by the, the Post Harvest Horticulture Training and Safe Food Center. We I are going internationally. This is brought to you by the topic is the most harmless horticulture plant training food and food and food and partnerships. We are going internationally. internationally. This is brought to you by the topic is the most harmless horticulture plant training food and food and food and partnerships. We are going internationally. This is brought to you by the topic is the most harmless horticulture plant training food and food and food and partnerships. We are going internationally. Evaluation for my certificate. Again, please uh, be mindful of our house rules for this episode. So now, let us have a glimpse of our participants via Zoom and also via Facebook. So to our participants, kindly visit www.menti.com and type the code 12744847. Again, kindly visit www.menti.com and type the code 12744847. Four eight four seven. So this will get, give us an idea of uh, the places or areas or uh, where are our participants currently watching via Zoom or Facebook. So keep your answers coming via the menti.com. Again, please visit www.menti.com and type the code 12744847. All right, so shout out to our participants who are watching from Los Baños, Laguna. So it's a sunny morning in Los Baños. And we also have participants from Gubat Sorsogon, Bulacan, Las Piñas, Davao City, all the way from Mindanao, Balete, Batangas. Wow, we have an international audience from Australia. So good morning from the Philippines. We also have participants from Cagayan de Oro, Alabang, Samar, Pinakbakdao, Samar. So we are live via Zoom and keep your answers coming. I hope that everyone is safe and healthy. All right. So shout out to all of you. And um, now to formally open the episode this morning. Let me call on the Director of Post-Harvest Horticulture Training and Research Center, Dr. Dorbita Del Carmen. Good morning po, Ma'am Dormi. Take it away. Good day, everyone. I am pleased to welcome all of our uh, participants from different parts of the Philippines, and uh, from across the globe, specifically from New Zealand and Asia, to the second episode of uh, Fresh Talks, the PhDRC webinar series, which is uh, streamed via Zoom and Facebook Live. The PhDRC, or uh, Post Harvest Horticulture Training and Research Center, is one of the research units of the College of Agriculture and Food Science, University of the Philippines, Los Baños, that undertakes research, development, and extension programs in the field of post-harvest handling of tropical horticultural crops. The PhDRC webinar series 
is an extension initiative with the hope of uh, reaching more of our partners and stakeholders and of uh, catering to the needs of a general public in keeping perishable commodities like fruits and vegetables fresh and of good quality. These webinars aim to further EHDRC's cause of ensuring quality and reducing losses and waste in fresh produce. For uh, the first episode last May 7, 2021, uh, Dr. Antonio Acedo Jr., one of uh, our alumnus and colleagues, shared his experiences from the consultancy projects in improving the handling and distribution of vegetables in Southeast Asia. This time, uh, we are equally honored to have with us an alumna who has gone a long way in working in post-harvest horticulture research with multinational companies. And uh, currently, she holds a scientist post in the New Zealand Institute for Plant and Food Research. She will be uh, sharing with us her institute's experiences in partnering with industry stakeholders, not only in New Zealand, but in other countries. We hope to gain insights from uh, their experiences, which we can adopt or apply here in our country. Um, by the way, this webinar is uh, also one of the activities of the PHTRC in line with its participation in the celebration of the International Year of Fruits and Vegetables 2021. Uh, this was uh, designated by the United Nations General Assembly to raise awareness on the importance of uh, fruits and vegetables and uh, human nutrition and health and food security, as well as in achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, so here's to an enriching and fruitful discussion this morning. Thank you all for joining. Thank you very much, Dr. Del Carmen, for that message. Thank you, ma'am, for highlighting the objective of this webinar, especially this episode, which is to raise awareness among our food industry stakeholders on the importance of reducing the losses and maintaining the quality and safety of fresh produce. And yes, same with the first episode, we will be featuring an alumna of PHDRC in this episode. So please stay tuned, everyone. Now we are fortunate to have the Dean of the College of Agriculture and Food Science, UP Los Banos, to give us an opening message. So let me call on Dean Elpidio Agvisit Jr. Good morning, po, Dean. Hi, good morning, General. Uh, do you hear me properly? Yes, sir, loud and clear. Okay, to, to our guest speaker for this morning, our alumna, Dr. Guinevere I. Ortiz, to our friends and partners from the New Zealand Institute for Plant and Research, Food, Food Research, to the Director of the Post Harvest Horticulture and Training Research Center, Dr. Dormita Del Carmen, to the men and women of PHTRC and the College of Agriculture and Food Science, participants, guests, friends, a blessed and pleasant morning to all. On behalf of the College of Agriculture and Food Science of the University of the Philippines, Los Banos, I wish to greet and thank all the participants in today's webinar entitled the New Zealand Institute for Plant and Food Research Partnership for Impactful Science. 
I wish also to greet you a happy International Year of Fruits and Vegetables. It is good that we have invited a renowned speaker for today who will share with us the post-harvest handling practices on fruits and vegetables in New Zealand. New Zealand is known for its dairy and sheep industry, but it's also known, it's also known to produce vast numbers of horticultural products such as kiwi and other temperate and subtropical fruits due to its climate that is suitable for horticultural production. In today's webinar, definitely everyone will learn the good practices and how can we apply this to Philippine setting. We could also view how their practices reduces food losses and waste and how they keep those produce fresh for exportation. Moreover, may, maybe we can adapt practices which we can do at home and how to properly store our food, especially now that accessibility and availability of fresh food has become more of an issue due to COVID-19 pandemic. In this way, we are also addressing sustainable development goals, responsible consumption and production because we can lessen food wastage and losses. To our guest speaker, Dr. Ortiz, thank you for sharing some of your valuable time to impart knowledge and experiences to us. To, the, to all the participants, thank you for supporting this webinar. May we have a sustainable and resilient food system and may all our dreams come true. Hiraya Manawari, God bless us all. General. Thank you very much, Zine, for uh, gracing us with your presence for this morning. What a better way to start our morning. Indeed, we hope to learn and adapt the best uh, practices from other countries to the Philippines. Thank you, Paul Zine, and good morning. Uh, may I request our panelists to uh, turn on your video camera for a brief photo op. So just a quick photo op. May I request everyone in the panel, uh, our panelists to kindly turn on your video. All right, so can we see your faces, <laughs> everyone? Okay. Okay, can we uh, stop screen sharing for Mona? All right. So at the count of people, in three, two, one, smile. One more, at the count of people, in three, two, one. All right, so thank you everyone. And we wish everyone a good day. So at this point of time, it is my pleasure to introduce our resource, our resource speaker. She is a post-harvest sociologist by training and brings a strong commercial orientation to her career, having spent almost 10 years as an industry research scientist and manager with Dole Food Company and Del Monte Fresh Produce, both in the Philippines. She was a post-harvest scientist and concurrent fresh pineapple quality assurance head at Dole and post-harvest manager at Del Monte Fresh. Her key areas of specialty are tropical and temperate fruit commercial handling techniques, pineapple and banana pre and post harvest physiology, fruit quality assurance, and this infestation technology. She also has previous experience in Papua New Guinea as principal post harvest scientist at the PNG National Agricultural Research Institute in Nari. She managed and implemented several projects, including mapping and improvement of sweet potato supply chains in PNG, a project funded by the Australian Center for International Agriculture Research. She joined Plant and Food Research in 2018 and has since called New Zealand as her home away from home. Among her most notable works since joining PFR is the design of a technical consultancy project of NAFUD's group one of Vietnam's leading fresh fruit exporters to assist in the development of their passion fruit supply chain. 
Her current project involvement at EFR include the new premium dragon fruit variety development project in Vietnam, three avocado projects based in Myanmar, Kenya, and Vietnam, the Vietnam Climate Smart Value Chain Project, Tonga Watermelon, and development of this infestation technologies for breadfruit in Samoa. The countries where she has worked are New Zealand, the Philippines, and Vietnam, Myanmar, Samoa, Japan, Papua New Guinea, South Korea, Kenya, and the United States. She holds a PhD in Agricultural Science from the University of Tsukuba, Japan, as well as Master of Science in Horticulture from UP Los Banos, and a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture from Ateneo de Davao University. It is my honor, let us all welcome, joining us from New Zealand, Dr. Guenever Ortiz. Good morning, ma'am, from the Philippines. Uh, good morning to everyone. Um, allow me to share my screen. Yes, ma'am, you can now share your screen. Well, thank you. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yes, ma'am. You can see. Okay. Now. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, General, for the wonderful introduction. At the outset, I wish to thank Dr. Del Carmen and the rest of PhDRC for giving me the opportunity to give back through this webinar. I'm proud to say that I owe most of my training as a post-harvest scientist to PhDRC. Anyway, from Auckland City, New Zealand, good day to each and everyone. Uh, to those who are calling from the Philippines, good morning to all of you. It is 2 p.m. here in New Zealand and it's around uh, 15 degrees where I am. Um, special shout out to my family, relatives and friends who I suspect based on viewer statistics make up half of the entire audience of this webinar. So hello to all of you. So today, allow me to introduce to you our organization the New Zealand Institute for Plant and Food Research or simply Plant and Food Research. I'm guessing most of you are hearing about us for the first time, but uh, we've been around for a while. Uh, we are a New Zealand-based science company providing research and development that adds value to fruit, vegetable, crop, and food products. As a company, PFR seeks to partner with a range of research, commercial, and industry players to ensure the science we do has real and quick impact. The partnerships that we have built are not limited to New Zealand alone, but over the years, we have built partnerships and, and long, uh, built partnerships uh, and research and development collaborations. So today's talk is divided into two big subtopics. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about who we are as an organization, our sites, our science, with special emphasis on our post-harvest research capability. And second, I'll talk about our ongoing partnerships within the fruit industry of New Zealand. And finally, our partnerships with the rest of the world highlighting on PFR's International Development Unit and our ongoing work on dragon fruit in Vietnam. So to begin with, uh, PFR is part of New Zealand Seven Crown Research Institutes, or CRI. Uh, CRIs are corporatized uh, crown entities charged with conducting scientific research. CRIs date from 1992, with most formed out of parts of the former Department of Scientific and Industrial Research and of elements of various go government agencies. Other than PFR, there's Ag Research, uh, which serves the agriculture and biotechnology sectors of New Zealand. There's also ESR, which supports the environment sector, and Scion, which supports forestry, uh, just to name a few. Uh, PFR has a unique uh, structure in the sense that over the years, it has evolved from a government institution to a science service company to a technology development company. Our mission is to create the world's most sustainable food production systems. And our core purpose is to enhance the value and productivity of New Zealand's horticultural, arable, seafood, and food and beverage industries 
to contribute to economic growth and the environmental and social prosperity of New Zealand. Our strategy has three elements that together will deliver a smart green future for Aotearoa New Zealand. Invest to create world-class science, apply to create maximum value, and share to create wealth and prosperity. Our seven strategic strands support our mission and sets us on the path to deliver a smart green future. Successful implementation of our strategy requires us to invest, apply, and share. PFR also believes that science can create a better future. Our research creates healthy, nutritious foods produced from the world's best food systems. Our research looks at the whole food system. We understand what consumers want and apply our knowledge in the lab and field to create new foods with great nutrition and that appeal to consumers, whether they want novel colors, longer shelf life, or the perfect food for eating on the go. We also understand the biology of natural systems and use this to help the plant and marine-based food sectors produce more and better food, using fewer inputs and making the most from everything they harvest while strengthening the resilience of productive ecosystems. Our sectors include the following. We use world-leading science to improve the way we grow, fish, harvest, and share food. It's not just about growing the crunchiest apple with the perfect flavor balance, the juiciest kiwi fruit with an exciting color, or the freshest muscle infused with ocean flavors. It's about everything that goes into producing the best food from the world's most sustainable systems. We want to make sure our food offers the best nutrition and is produced with minimal impact on the natural world. We are not only looking at how we produce food today, but how we can improve food and food production systems for ourselves and future generations. Our customers include uh, Zespri, Kiwi Fruit, um, the Ministry of Primary Industries, uh, Ministry of Health, uh, New Zealand Wine, uh, New Zealand Apples and Pears, New Zealand Avocado, just to name a few. Um, we have more than 1,000 staff based at 14 sites all over New Zealand and as well as in our offices in Australia and the USA. Our workforce, for example, uh, based on national ethnic origins of new recruits, um, the Filipinos, I know most of you would be very curious about this. Uh, there are about 15 Filipinos or Filipino Kiwis uh, scattered all over the 14 uh, locations of BFR, three of whom are scientists, uh, one research associate, and the rest are with IT and project support. And of course, um, uh, UP Los Banos is well represented. There are three of us uh, UP Los Banos alumni at Plant and Food Research. As PFR is a corporation, we are headed by a CEO in the person of Mr. David Hughes. Directly under him are general managers who look after finance, uh, science services, uh, technical, de uh, technical technology development, HR, marketing and innovation, Maori. And under their respective GMs are different portfolios, groups and units that make up the organization. I have highlighted both food innovation and international development as these are the groups that I work with. Our funding is, uh, our activities are funded through a mix of New Zealand government research, investment, and our commercial partnerships. So most of our funding are coming from our commercial partners and next followed by royalties that we receive from the companies you have worked with and strategic, fundings, uh, strategic funding and so on. In terms of science performance, we are proud to say that um, we have maintained a very good average in 2018, 2019 alone, we have produced 384 peer-reviewed publications and have achieved 85% of our milestones as scheduled. Uh, in, uh, in terms of science performance, we have got international awards, invitation onto editorial boards, uh, into international committees, and uh, 
uh, fabric, an average number of citations of 3.36 per published paper per year. We have also numerous publications in these prestigious scientific journals, including Nature and Nature Plants. So uh, where, in, where is New Zealand on the world map? Um, unless, uh, oh, like maybe some of you might think that New Zealand is in Australia. Uh, New Zealand is a totally separate country. Uh, it's, it has a total land area of around 268,000 square kilometers. Uh, bit, uh, Philippines is just a bit bigger than New Zealand. A population of 5 million as of March 2020. And we're, uh, we're the 53rd largest economy in the world based on GDP and the least corrupt country in the world as of uh, 2020 Transparency Index rating. Um, we are uh, located all over New Zealand from north to south. So New Zealand is divided into two big island islands, uh, the North and the South Island, uh, very original. And we have offices in Australia and the USA as well. Um, each location has its own areas of research. And in the case of Auckland, where I'm based at, we do consumer and sensory science, post-harvest science, plant genomics, plant pathology, entomology, and food safety. Among the locations, uh, the, the Auckland office, uh, where, where the headquarters is, is, so is by far the biggest, followed by Lincoln. Our science. So our science combines market insight with a fundamental understanding of the biology of our food resources. Uh, in terms of new cultivar innovation, um, we, we aim to produce better cultivars faster. And we are the brains behind Zespri Sun Gold Kiwi Fruit, which has more than 25 million trays sold in 2015, and Cy Fresh or Jazz Apples, which has an excellent shelf life and is rated in Europe by consumers in Europe and the USA as outstanding. In terms of bioprotection, we aim to reduce uh, to produce residue-free pest and disease control measures. PFR played a very important role when Shudomonas Syrian J or PSA was discovered in New Zealand in 2010. It was the most significant biological threat the kiwi fruit industry had ever faced. More than 100 plant and food staff worked with Zespri and its growers to fight PSA disease, learning more about the disease in six months than had ever previously been known. And because of this, in 2017, the team was awarded New Zealand's highest science recognition, the Prime Minister's Science Prize for their response. Today, the future of the kiwi fruit industry is looking brighter than ever. In terms of sustainable production systems, uh, we have uh, developed a grape yield model to allow grape growers to predict yield based on climate data. Uh, there's also potato calculator, as a guide to the use of water and nitrogen inputs. And we have uh, bred uh, varroa tolerant bees. Varroa is a mite that, has, uh, that attacks the bees and it can cost uh, the damage, it can cost up to 900 million over the 35 years. In terms of seafood technologies, uh, we have also developed uh, several technologies, including CFINE, marine collagen sourced by patented extraction process, uh, modular harvesting system. Uh, this targets specific species and fish sizes based on an understanding of fish biology. So you're not just catch catching fish, uh, you're, you're selectively catching them. So it enables fish to be landed alive and undamaged. We have also developed Acquies or a patented fish and aesthetic for use in research and commercial fish handling and, har and harvesting. Food innovation, we aim to produce premium foods and beverages. And uh, we have developed the food composition database. Uh, it's a database for more than 2,600 foods that are commonly eaten in New Zealand and have developed a new prepackaged vegetable product range called Vital Vegetables. And we have validated scientific evidence that supports the link between zespri green kiwi fruit and digestive health. 
As post-harvest research is an integral part of food innovation, I will now segue into sharing with you the post-harvest research capability at PFR. The post-harvest research group of PFR is one of the largest and best equipped post-harvest groups in the Southern Hemisphere and is in the top five globally as assessed in 2016. The three themes under this uh, group are post-harvest science, fresh food metabolism, microscopy, and cell walls. Uh, we have extensive world-class research facilities, over 80 temperature-controlled rooms, heat treatment facilities, including water baths and hot air units, ethylene treatment systems, microscopes, gas chromatographs, quality and texture assessment tools in purpose-built rooms, and sensory science laboratories. The post-harvest team is based in Auckland and is led by Dr. Alan Wolf and in Hawke's Bay by Dr. Jason Johnston. Our 10 key research areas, which I will talk about one by one in the succeeding slides are as follows. Fast phenotyping for storage characteristics for breeding new cultivars, maturity indexes and harvest criterion for different marketing destinations, segregation of harvested fruit crops on a batch or individual fruit basis, cool chain management, understanding storage disorder reduction and prediction, ethylene and antagonists management, controlled modified and modified atmosphere storage, factors affecting phytonutrients, sensory quality and consumer responses, quarantine treatments, and minimal processing. In terms of fast phenotyping for storage characteristics, the ultimate goal is to breed new cultivars. We have uh, closely collaborated with the breeding and genomics team to identify biomarkers and molecular pathways related to storage and eating quality. And because of this, it has allowed breeders to make crosses between selected parents and produce seedlings for further evaluation faster. In terms of maturity indices and harvest criterion for different marketing destinations, uh, for existing cultivars and newly released uh, new cultivars, uh, it is important to, to determine harvest dates based on maturity indices and is critical for post-harvest management of harvested crops. So we have developed target-specific maturity indices for kiwi fruit and stone fruit industries to expand their harvest and market season and to ease labor facility crisis during the harvest season. In terms of fruit segregation, we're working closely with Compaq and has led to development of world leading fruit grading and sorting technologies. We have also developed prediction models for softening and disorders that allow segregation of harvested crops for differential inventory management to reduce fruit loss. In terms of cool chain management, we have 100 temperature controlled storage and ripening room cabinets. And this has enabled us to have a deeper understanding on the initiation and development of chilling injury, identifying factors affecting CI or chilling injury and optimizing cool chain management to avoid and alleviate chilling injury. So we are closely collaborating with engineers in detecting fruit with chilling injury at near market fruit to eliminate injured fruit for marketing. We have also developed a risk prediction model that uses data on seasonal conditions in conjunction with on orchard observations. So this allows you to predict when the likelihood, when, when these orders are likely to develop in apples from specific blocks. So what are the outcomes? Uh, well, it allows you to have an informed logistical decisions regarding the length of storage. It allows you to extend your market window for premium markets. And also it allows you to have more efficient use of, of CA facilities and protection of, for example, in our case, protection of New Zealand's reputation for premium quality apples. Ethylene, uh, we are equipped with ethylene treatment, scrubbing and ethylene measurement facilities. So we are able to work closely with AgroFresh, for example, and optimize protocol for one MCP or one methyl cyclopropene pre and post harvest to delay fruit maturation and, sub and subsequent ripening process. 
our controlled and modified atmosphere storage facilities allows us to focus on identifying suitable O2 and CO2 concentrations for different fruit crops and to manage negative effects. So in, in short, we have helped the persimmon and summer fruit industries to identify suitable films and development develop a practical ways to use MA package to extend storage life. Uh, we are also equipped with sensory evaluation facility and uh, we have developed the New Zealand data, uh, food composition database. And in terms of development of these infestation treatments, we have high pressure water washing, we have cool storage, uh, use of cool storage in air or in CA, heat treatments, x ray, and fumigation using ozone, phosphine, ethyl formate, and others. Our disinfestation work has also led to the development of a fumigation free cleaning and disinfestation protocol for the export of taro to New Zealand and have had 10 successful runs so far. The protocol combines high pressure washing and hot water treatment that reads the taro of nematodes, thrips, and mites. We have also had collaborative work with our partners at the Scientific Research Organization of Samoa uh, to develop alternative treatment protocols to provide a pathway for the importation of breadfruit into New Zealand and Australia. And lastly, uh, we have developed a patented three-step process that uses aqueous vortex with high-intensity UVC treatment, followed by short hot water treatments and cold calcium ascorbate dips. This has been commercialized for producing apple slices. So um, the sectors served by our group are the following organizations for new cultivar development, we are also partners with industry like Zespri, TNG Global, Avoco, Agrofresh, uh, to name a few, and other government agencies and funding organizations such as MFAT or the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, the Ministry of Primary Industries, and so on. Okay, so on the second main topic about our partnerships, uh, first I'm going to talk about our partnerships within New Zealand, specifically within the New Zealand fruit industry. The New Zealand fruit industry is a multi-million multi dollar, multi-billion dollar rather industry. In 2019 alone, it reported a dollar value of around 6.4 billion with a staggering 64% growth for the past 10 years. And among its biggest dollar earners are the kiwi fruit and apple industries, highlighted by red. From New Zealand, our fruit exports travel through thousands of miles and reach as far as Europe, North America, Asia, and Africa. The New Zealand horticulture industry has a unique structure in that there is an overarching body that advocates for and represents the interests of its 6,000 commercial fruit and vegetable growers. This body is called Horticulture New Zealand. Although kiwi fruit is the single largest fruit export of New Zealand, it hasn't always been that way. In the next few slides, allow me to share its story and perhaps for our viewers in the Philippines, pick an insight or two on how to possibly apply this model in order to help the Philippine fruit industry maximize its goal. As the single largest horticultural export, kiwi fruit records a staggering $2.3 billion annual earning. It has also experienced a staggering growth with a sales revenue of 2.1 billion, and it, rep it represents 32% of New Zealand's total horticultural export revenue. And quick statistics, there are about 2,800 kiwi fruit growers, around 12,000 hectares of kiwi fruit are in production. 81% of New Zealand grown kiwi fruit comes from the Bay of Plenty. So the map on your right, shows the, the kiwi fruit growing areas in New Zealand with the biggest bulk of it coming from the Bay of Plenty. And Zespri International Limited is the world's largest marketing of ki marketer of kiwi fruit, selling into more than 53 countries and managing 30% of the global volume. Zespri is the sole global exporter of New Zealand grown kiwi fruit. So many of you might think that kiwi fruit is native to New Zealand. 
It is otherwise called as Chinese gooseberry. Uh, in the kiwi fruit arrived on New Zealand shores uh, only at the turn of the 20th century when New Zealand school principal Isabel Fraser brought some kiwi fruit seeds back from her travels. It was rebranded as kiwi fruit in 1959 by the fruit exporter Turners and Growers. And so now the, the, the fruit is named after the furry brown fruit. The, the furry brown fruit is named after New Zealand's furry brown flightless national bird, which is, ki which is the kiwi. So that's how it got, it, it got its name. The real commercial beginnings of kiwi fruit sit in the 1960s. The growth of the export market during this time was composed of individual growers, grower cooperatives, and exporters and distributors. However, in the 1980s, other countries began to export kiwi fruit and New Zealand lost its first mover advantage. The seven licensed exporters in New Zealand were in fierce competition and driving down prices. This reduced grower profitability and cost fluctuations in both supply and demand. Subsequently, a referendum was held in 1988 and growers voted in favor of moving from multiple exporters to a single desk system. The New Zealand Kiwi Fruit Marketing Board came into being and its first season of operation was in 1990. In 1992-93, as a result of various governance and management factors, the board got into serious difficulty, and in response, the industry put in place a three-stage review that incorporated major structural change, including the creation of the New Zealand Kiwi Fruit Growers Incorporated, the creation of the Zespri brand, and the alter, alter, alteration of the industry structure, which included the establishment of collaborative marketing, the NZKGI forum, and a more efficient onshore operations. So in 2000, uh, Zespri was officially corporatized with a single desk status remaining. To date, Zespri is the primary exporter of New Zealand grown kiwi fruit to all countries other than Australia. So that's the story of how the kiwi fruit industry came into being and is uh, successful up to this day. The key organizations and how they work together to make industry decisions. As with the horticulture industry, the kiwi fruit industry also has Kiwi Fruit New Zealand, which monitors and enforces the kiwi fruit export regulations. KNZ is the kiwi fruit industry's regulator and gives ZESPI the mandate to be the vehicle of the single point entry system. So what is the role of PFR on, in the kiwi fruit industry? As part of the key organizations, PFR carries out 60% of the kiwi fruit industry's research. PFR has a broad kiwi fruit uh, research program which covers new cultivar development, supply chain, and consumer added value. Our site in Tepuki is home to the largest kiwi fruit breeding population outside of China. PFR works with the kiwi fruit industry to develop orchard management programs, manage pests and diseases, and reduce chemical and water inputs, and optimize post-harvest protocols to ensure fruit are delivered to consumer in a premium condition. So these are our ongoing kiwi fruit-related post-harvest research activities. We do mat fruit maturity and harvest indices, harvest handling and storage systems, temperature responses, including chilling injury, CA storage, and kiwi fruit sensory projects offshore. So what are the next steps? Uh, the next steps is the Kiwi Fruit Breeding Center. It's a 50-50 joint venture between Zespri and Plant and Food Research. And the center would be dedicated to breeding new kiwi fruit cultivars, creating healthier, better tasting, and more sustainability-focused varieties to fulfill the growing demand for consumers. So uh, in terms of fostering global partnerships, this is a, a, a diff, a ne our next topic. Um, PFR has created the International Development Unit in order to expand the experience base and worldliness of our scientific capability and expand our brand profile in the Asia Pacific region. IDU was established in 2017 
and it leads PFR's effort in the international development space, develop business strategy plan, strategic partnerships, diversify the funding base, and overseeing project delivery. Um, IDU partners to create end-to-end -end programs that are highly innovative, accelerate development, and bring sustainable, lasting impact. Our people. Um, there are several myths around who should and shouldn't do international development work, including you have to be super experienced to work in ID. It's more for people in the twilight of their careers. Or to be effective, you have to have experience in tropical agriculture. Research and international development are mutually exclusive. However, I am a living testament that none of these myths are true. Some people think that you either do science or do international development. But I think you can be a scientist who does good science outside the lab and contributes to international development outcome. You can do both. So this is who we are. Um, the unit is headed by Dr. Susie Newman and under her are program managers and project leaders, including myself, that look after individual projects. Where we work. At the moment, our current portfolio is focused to eat within Southeast Asia and the Pacific, but with an extended footprint into Africa, Caribbean, and other countries. We have approximately 6 million per annum and nine large projects in seven countries plus some other smaller initiatives. So despite us being relatively new, our current footprint extends as far as the Caribbean on the east and Kenya on the west. And these are our active projects on a per country basis. In Vietnam, we have Vietnam avocado, Vietnam dragon fruit, Vietnam safe vegetables, and Viet fruit. In Cambodia, we have Cambodia quality horticulture, Cambodia codes. And in Myanmar, we have the Myanmar Avocado Project, which I am leading, and the Myanmar Resilient Horticulture Project. Also in Kenya, we have the Kenya Avocado Project, the India Horticulture Project in India, and Samoa Taro in Samoa, and Caribbean Sargassum Project in Barbados. In the Philippines, uh, we are trying to develop a quality assurance system for Philippine mangoes. This is in conjunction with the ministry, uh, with, the Philippine, uh, with the New Zealand Embassy in Manila and the New Zealand Government to Government Initiative. We also have Tonga Vanilla in Tonga, as well as Tonga Watermelon Project. As a way of showing an example on where and where we work uh, and how we work, Next, I'm going to highlight on our ongoing work in Vietnam in helping the dragon fruit sector expand. So why dragon fruit though? For one, dragon fruit has got amazing prospects in Vietnam. I think this is also true in the case of the Philippines. It grew into a $1 billion industry in, 20, uh, $1 billion industry in 2017 alone and is Vietnam's biggest export. To date, area planted to dragon fruit in Vietnam has increased to around 44,000 hectares. In Vietnam, dragon fruit is mostly grown along the Mekong Delta in the south, but could extend to as far as Bintan province further north. So this is the uh, dragon fruit project that we are currently implementing in Vietnam. Uh, it started in 2013 and is funded by the New Zealand uh, Foreign Affairs and Trade, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and our partners for this project are two Vietnam-based research institutions, namely the Southern Horticultural Research Institute, or SOFRI, and the Sub-Institute for Agricultural Engineering and Post-Harvest Technology, or SIAP. The project operates on this model where in a breeding program coupled with a sustainable production system and post-harvest systems program, work together with a common goal of improving the livelihoods and competitive advantage of dragon fruit farmers and supply chain participants in Vietnam. The program has got four major components, namely uh, dragon fruit canker management, sustainable production, breeding and commercialization, and post-harvest systems improvement. 
Under its canker management program, a protocol for canker control has been developed which help control disease and fruit losses by up to 50%. Canker control was achieved through orchard hygiene, plant management and fungicide program. In case you didn't know, uh, canker is caused by a type of fungus but uh, is considered the most serious disease affecting the dragon fruit industry in Vietnam and globally. Once it attacks an orchard, it, it has the potential to wipe out an entire, uh, wipe out and destroy an entire orchard. Uh, for sustainable production, uh, under our sustainable production systems component, we introduced a method of production using the T-bar system, which is on your right, on the right side of the screen. So versus the traditional mopped up system, which is the one on your left, and I think uh, this is also popular in the Philippines. Um, uh, the T-bar innovative system gives higher productivity, high quality fruit, excellent spray penetration and sustainable production. Um, a lot of farms have now switched to the T-bar system and have given them higher production and higher and fruit with higher quality. In terms of breeding and commercialization, we have developed new proprietary dragon fruit variety released for commercialization through a controlled production model, very much like uh, how we do kiwi fruit, apples, and others here at PFR. In terms of post-harvest systems improvement, uh, we've been able to develop dragon fruit washers improved post-harvest protocols in terms of optimization of storage temperature, development of pre-cooling protocols and equipment, and capacity building of industry participants. So far, the uptake of the best practice post-harvest system is as high as 75%. So this is our project team. Uh, the post-harvest team is led by myself and Dr. Alan Wolf with our partners from Sofri and CIAP. Uh, the post-harvest project component uh, aims to enhance the quality of dragon fruit in terms of cleaning, reduced damage, and improved storage life. So although uh, dragon fruit is relatively easy to grow, it's a bit of a problematic crop from a post-harvest perspective. One, it has a short shelf life. It's highly perishable. There's a threat of pests and diseases, especially canker. It has high susceptibility to chilling injury and there are fruit sanitation issues. And so we have identified the following areas for improvement, such as cool chain, improved cool chain, temperature management, packaging, fruit cleaning and sanitation, and fruit disinfestation. So the photo on your right shows uh, the temperature at pack out, which is still high at 21.3 degrees Celsius. From the time work began in 2013, the project is proud to have accomplished the following. The development of high pressure washing machines to clean fruit instead of hand cleaning. Um, the fruit is not easy to clean. The surface itself can harbor insects, sooty mold, dust, and agrochemical residues. And to add insult to injury, the bracts easily break and are hard to clean around. The red cultivar has curved bracts even. The blossom end cavity can also harbor insects and dirt, uh, which is uh, pointed by the yellow arrow. So the first version of the dragon fruit washer was conceptualized and fabricated in 2014 and first commissioning in 2015. The design consisted of an eight meter feeding conveyor that is connected to a soaking tank. After soaking, individual fruit pass through shorter conveyor belt and into a rotary table equipped with individual baskets or fruit holders that can accommodate a single fruit at a time. High cleaning efficiency is achieved as the fruit pass two rotors, top and bottom, with four nozzles per rotor that heat the fruit at different directions. The original design has above 90% cleaning efficiency, but broken scales or bracts below 10% and no damage to fruit, thereby ensuring export requirements are met for dragon fruit. However, 
Although the original, although the, the original design has excellent cleaning efficiency, it has low throughput, just uh, just around three to four tons per hour, and requires at least fifteen to seventeen people at a time to operate the machine at the washing section and pack the fruit. And so we have developed a second generation dragon fruit high pressure washer, which was designed by our partner Siap in Vietnam. The washer is equipped with a nozzle unit and a conveyor chain installed on top and below to spray the fruit from all sides, increasing the cleaning effect. This design ensures high pressure and flow for optimum washing performance. However, the machine had issues like clog nozzles, inefficient filtration system, and high mechanical damage to fruit. And so the third generation fruit washing Fruit washer consists of a longer soaking tank that allows for increased soaking time and uses nozzles from the spray system company to ensure consistent water pressure. And so this has this model has been widely adapted in many uh, pack houses in Vietnam at the moment. So just an example on how efficient the washing is uh, before and after washing. Another significant output from the project is the demonstration of the critical nature of storage temperature in improving fruit storage life of dragon fruit, which includes storage temperature optimization. Uh, from this project, we have demonstrated the damaging effect of high storage temperature, such as 8 degrees uh, to 12 degrees Celsius for even two weeks, as well as similarly damaging effects of storage at too low temp a temperature. It has provided a clear temperature target of four to six degrees Celsius for optimal fruit storage for the industry. Six degrees Celsius is now uh, widely used in Vietnam for dragon fruit. To come up with this, we, we did extensive storage temperature experiments, um, one, three, six, nine, and 12 degrees Celsius, and were, was repeated through the dry and wet season uh, in Vietnam. So these are some of the photos that show the results of the dry season experiment. At 12 and nine degrees Celsius, those fruits that were, are wilting and color change of their bracts are evident. However, fruits stored at six, three and one remained fresh in appearance and had significantly fewer rats compared to fruits stored at 12 and nine. However, at one degree Celsius, signs of chilling injuries such as fruit skin cracking and yellowish skin become evident. So you can see uh, a, a photo of a fruit with external chilling injury after two weeks storage at one degree Celsius. After four weeks at nine, the most common disorder in those fruit were rots and wilting and color change of the bracts. Fruit stored at six, three, and one remained fresh in appearance and had significantly fewer rots. However, after storage uh, at five days, um, there's reduced fruit quality, both in terms of appearance, incidence of rust, and chilling injury. So that's how we came about with the recommendation of using six degrees Celsius as optimum storage temperature for dragon fruit. Another key output, output of the project is the development of pre-cooling and fruit handling protocols. Uh, it's a significant milestone as we have developed a cheap and portable pre-cooling system, which demonstrated that fruit should either be pre-cooled using a forced air system or held in a standard cool store with open pallets stacking for three to four days to ensure fruit temperature reduces to the target flesh temperature of about six degrees Celsius. The portable pre-cooling system, which is shown in the photo, is cheap and easy to do. All that's needed are a portable fan with tarpaulin and manometer, electrical supply, three-phase power, cold room, which can be a normal cold room or a dedicated room. We also need hard plastic strips to keep uh, the cover openings and bottoms of pallets and temperature luggers with stainless steel external probes. So it's a very, sim uh, it's a very simple setup. Another milestone or key output is the development of a treatment regime which combines the use of chlorine and hot water dipping for post-harvest disease control, particularly for both surface-borne and latent infection, which has played a significant role in post-harvest disease management in pack houses that have adopted the technology. So this is how uh, 
this is how the protocol looks like. Uh, it's a combination of sanitation using chlorine and hot water treatment. Also, in order to help achieve sustainable implementation of improved post-harvest practices in the dragon fruit supply chain, we have also built the capacity of packhouse managers and staff in the province of Zhenzhang, Long'an, and Bintan by way of providing classroom type training. So far, we have trained a total of 28 packhouses from the period 2018 to 2020. So these are some photos from our classroom type training in Vietnam. In addition to wider industry workshops, we have also adapted a targeted training or a needs-based training approach for selected pack houses that can act as best practice models, demonstrations for other pack houses. So one of the major criteria for selection of these pack houses was a willingness or criterion to follow advice and make changes and to share their learnings and improvements with other pack houses. So far, we have trained eight pack houses within the dragon fruit growing region. And as per last assessment, um, they are qu doing quite well. We have also produced reference and training materials, both in English and Vietnamese. Uh, so this is the post-harvest manual for dragon fruit handling and storage. And we are now into producing the second edition in both English and Vietnamese. We also have the dragon fruit manual. And lastly, uh, through the project, we have helped establish the Sofri Post-Harvest Laboratory. So they are well equipped. They've got generators, they have refrigerated cabinets, two cold stores, fruit texture analyzers, and so on and so forth. And so uh, you can access more information from our website, uh, www.plantandfood.com, or you can write to us for additional information instructions are on the website. Also, post-harvest 2024 is happening in New Zealand in the picturesque town of Rotorua. There should be enough time for you to prepare and save for that trip to Middle Earth in 2024. Finally, my deepest appreciation to the following individuals and teams for the help in making this presentation possible in one way or another. Thank you, Tanakoto. Maraming salamat po. Thank you, Dr. Ortiz, for that comprehensive presentation. Wow. And uh, um, uh, we would like to express our gratitude for, for sharing you with us the uh, post-harvest research and uh, international development practices and innovation done in EFR. Also, we witnessed the collaboration, your collaboration with other agencies and organizations all over the world. So what a productive and a prolific institution. Well, despite the cold afternoon there in Auckland, we felt the warmth of your presence this morning by being our resource speaker and uh, with your sharings about New Zealand, particularly the uh, horticulture industry. No doubt that uh, NZ is really a progressive country. And we hope that the models you presented to us will be suitable or suited to the Philippine condition, especially if it will be adopted by our uh, farmers and also industry stakeholders. And um, to quote ma'am, yes, it's about everything uh, in order to produce safe and quality food in a sustainable manner. And uh, I would like also to mention ma'am that it's good to hear that there are also other Filipino scientists working there. So thank you very much, Dr. Ortiz. And uh, by the way, we are also live streamed via, via the PHTRC's YouTube channel, other than those um, watching via Zoom. So as of the moment, ma'am, uh, we have about 140 viewers across platforms. So to our participants, you can now ask questions. This is your time to ask questions to our user speaker. So kindly type in your questions in the Zoom Q&A button or comment on the YouTube section, comment section. All right, so we are encouraging our participants to ask questions. If you have uh, questions, okay. All right, so ma'am, we have a question here from an anonymous attendee. This is in the context of a uh, pandemic, ma'am. How did, how did COVID-19 affect 
the supply chain of fresh produce, especially the kiwi fruit industry in New Zealand? Um, I think the the it it went relatively normal, but I think one of the most uh, one of the most challenging times for New Zealand was the lack of people who would harvest the fruit because the borders were closed. But later on, they they started letting people in to to uh, fill up the workforce, and that's how uh, that's how the industry coped with uh, the, the pandemic. But other than that, um, shipment went on as normal. All right. So at least, ma'am, even uh, or despite the logistical concerns or uh, mm. restrictions imposed by the lockdown and pandemic. Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah, the uh, condition is still normal there. Um, another question, uh, ma'am, is um, another anonymous attendee. Do farmers already utilize the dragon fruit washer and feed cooling methods or is it commercially available? And the uh, follow-up question is, have you considered the socioeconomic benefits of the washing system for dragon fruit? Uh, yeah, um, it's widely adapted at the moment, uh, especially for the bigger ones. So it could vary like, we are not saying that they're, they really copied the design that we recommended, but they made modifications. As you know, uh, people would like to do it as cheap as they possibly could. But in terms of adoption, it's, 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 it's growing. Uh, and I hope uh, dragon fruit growers in the Philippines would pick it up as well. And uh, in terms of socioeconomic, I think that's part of, of what we're doing. Uh, the, the project is just about to end. And I think uh, we should be able to get those data uh, in the end, uh, towards the end of the project. All right. So at least ma'am, it's already, uh, or the adoption is already there. And um, yeah. we also wish that it can be adopted here in the Philippines. And um, we trust and we know our farmers here that um, they are really resourceful when it comes to, you know, um, making uh, alterations or modifications of a model just to fit their situation. Yeah. Um, another question, Mom, from our Zoom participant. Um, what is the arrangement between your organization and the partners in other countries in order for your organization to assist in some projects? I will repeat what. What is the arrangement between your organization and the partners in other countries in order for your organization to assist in some projects? Mm, uh, every collaborative work is unique, I guess. Uh, for example, uh, the work that we're doing in the Philippines, uh, we did a scoping study in 2019 to look at uh, the, the problems that are that our mango growers in the Philippines are facing. Uh, that was an initiative that was sponsored by the New Zealand Embassy in Manila and a New Zealand-based um, agency called G2G Know How. Uh, they are with the New Zealand Trade and Enterprise. And so uh, with that, uh, we were able to meet with various stakeholders in Davao, uh, in, in Mindanao. And in so doing, we were able to identify the, the problems that we're facing. And we designed a technical consultancy program uh, for Mindanao. But at the moment, we're still looking for private sector partners uh, who, who are willing to partner with us. And uh, good luck to us on that. And I hope uh, we'd be able to implement some projects in the Philippines pretty soon. Okay, ma'am. So we are also hoping that, that uh... There will be project uh, collaborations here in our country, more uh, projects from uh, the PFR. Um, um, a related question to the one raised a while ago. Um, does PFR offer partnership with academic institutions? Because right now we have uh, participants who are students. Some of them are probably yeah. graduate students. So mm -hmm. maybe they are interested. So do you have uh, mm -hmm. partnership with academic institutions or are there available opportunities for students and also other researchers at PFR? Yeah, okay. Good question though. Um, there are several pathways to doing that. For example, um, there are um, linkages established with universities, um, like individual students can, can apply for scholarships that are based in New Zealand. 
and um, in so doing, maybe um, a one one uh, scientist from uh, plant and food research can mentor them or serve as their graduate advisor, something like that, or or do it uh, institution to institution. It's 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 really easy though. Uh, we don't uh, we don't discriminate. We have partners in China. Uh, we have partners uh, all over the world, really. All right. So it's not only uh, for the our industry stakeholders, but also to those who are interested, uh, people involved in the academic institution. So um, in your presentation, ma'am, you have uh, presented, ma'am, the uh, link or the website of, of PRR, PFR. So maybe our participants can visit that. and um, mm, They can also email me our, uh, if they want to. Okay, so mom, also another related question to that. Um, do you have advice for uh, fresh graduates of post-harvest science that wants to go into research? So maybe um, they re really spark their interest or their interest uh, based on your presentation. No? And um, based on your experience, what types of uh, post-harvest research can you advise this? Uh, can you advise they, them to venture into. So it's a very specific question, man, if you can answer. Yeah, okay. I think I went, uh, I did not go to the road. Uh, I, I went to the road less traveled. Um, not many post-harvest scientists would go to the industry to gain experience. Uh, but for me, uh, the industry experience opened my eyes into the realities of, of fruit handling on the field. So it's not really, uh, do not limit yourselves to the academe, but uh, grow, grow and go outside of the academe and be open to opportunities to, uh, on opportunities to learning. So um, what are the science, the, the research areas? There are plenty depending on, on, on what you have. Um, I think at PHDRC, uh, there are so many research areas, uh, possible research areas. And I think, yeah, whatever way uh, they go, it's, 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 it's good. It's, it's a good way of building your career in post-harvest science. All right. Mom, I'm also learning from your answers. <laughs> there are quotable quotes like the road less traveled and there are a lot of opportunities for everyone who are interested or who is mm, yeah. Also, it's also good to explore international development. For me, uh, I did some work in Papua New Guinea, but I had to leave because of uh, security reasons in Papua New Guinea. But for me, I would gladly go back to that kind of career. And so I did uh, when, this, when this job uh, was offered to me in 2018. And so I took the opportunity to, to uh, because with, with private companies you're not able to share openly what you know uh, but with PFR uh, we are able to share and and uh, and my industry experiences helped me a lot in the international development work that we do. All right so to our participants Dr. Ortiz is our living proof that indeed there is an opportunity for post-harvest graduates. Oh yeah there. sure. <laughs> yeah so mom we still have more questions here. I hope you don't mind answering this question still, since you still have more time. Um, a question from Zoom. How can the consumers make sure that what they are buying are from New Zealand? Do we, do we <laughs> need to look for something as proof? <laughs> uh, um, the Zespri, uh, well, the Zespri, for example, the Zespri Kiri fruit has got a sticker on it. So it's it's... All of it are coming from New Zealand, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's difficult to tell. But yeah. yeah, the stickers would tell you where it's coming from. All right. So yeah, for our consumers, you have to check, we have to check always the label. <laughs> All right, Bob. So other question, ma'am, from Zoom as well. Um, who initiated the establishment of Kiwi Commodity Board and what is its composition? Are there commodity boards for other commodities? Yes, uh, all, all horticultural commodities have their own little group 
even the the feijoa ones even onions have their own group so it's it's really important to have a, a common voice for the industry so you you are not acting uh, as an individual but you are acting as a group so you 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 have a better voice than working individually so i wish this kind of model would be adapted in the fruit uh, in the fresh fruit industry in the philippines um, but not sure if that's even possible. Okay, ma'am. So I think the, the important takeaway there is there is that um, no money is an island. It's always best to work as a team. Because, mm. uh, uh, it's like uh, having more uh, minds to achieve a common goal. For not exactly. only for the center, but also for everyone, especially for our farmers. And uh, ma'am, we also have a question about... Um, uh, what sort of support does the organization provide to collaborative entities like the project in Vietnam? So let me repeat, what, what sort of support does the organization provide to collaborative entities like the project in Vietnam? Uh, it really depends on who your funding donor is. Uh, in the case of... of uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, it's a different... Uh, they have different conditions and for example in our avocado project in Vietnam which is uh, funded by the government to government initiative of New Zealand uh, we are providing consultancy so it, it's it's really it's really uh, it's it's a different ballgame depending on who's funding the project all right so um, uh, mom we also have other questions from zoom I think this is a specific question about your uh, uh, innovative or innovation when it comes to post-harvest research conducted at your EFR. What are the best ways to control um, invasive species, including plants, pests, and pathogens? So, do you have uh, probably oops. oops, I'm a post-harvest <laughs> physiologist, sorry, but we can direct that question to the right um, individuals. Okay. So it, it means, Mom, that uh, we have a diverse, uh, we have participants of diverse background. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh huh. Okay, Mom. This is also a specific question about your experiment conducted in dragon fruit, uh, because um, you have mentioned that those dragon fruit stored at one degree Celsius experience chilling injury. Yeah. So, um, do you have uh, post-harvest interventions to uh, at least alleviate the, the, the chilling injury in dragon fruit? So, we're not recommending too low or too high temperature, but uh, stick to four to six degrees, and the optimum of which is six degrees, so you don't get any chilling injury. Okay. So, uh, mom, in relation to that, um, do you have? Um, other post-harvest interventions, or do you couple it with um, like modified atmosphere packaging aside from just storing it purely mm. in the cold room? Yeah, uh, in Vietnam, uh, they just pack the fruit in, in polypropylene films. Uh, they don't do MA. And uh, we have yet to see a study that has proven that MA is, is successful in dragon fruit. And we would like to, uh, and, and it, it would be interesting to, to know how, how dragon fruit responds to MA storage. All right. So, okay, ma'am, uh, we still have another question <laughs> from the Zoom chat. Okay, so do farmers, oh, this is from Dr. Del Carmen, do farmers in New Zealand get subsidies from the government? Uh, I think in a way they do, mm -hmm. depending on the crop that they grow. Yeah, from the industry, yeah, they do. All right, so at least um, the initiatives when it comes to agriculture is well supported by the government. Yeah, it, it's well supported. Okay, so mom, I think that concludes our Q&A forum that's uh, 
really a uh, an interesting one and thank you for answering all the questions from our participants and to our participants who still have questions you can send that send us to us so that uh, dr ortiz could answer it via email or uh, other platform other means so at this juncture dr ortiz we will now award the certificate of appreciation to express our gratitude to you so please allow me to read the citation of the certificate. Post Harvest Horticulture Training and Research Center, College of Agriculture and Food Science, University of the Philippines, Los Banos, presents this certificate of appreciation to Dr. Guinevere I. Ortiz for sharing her valuable insights as a research speaker during the PHTRC Fresh Talks webinar series with her lecture entitled The New Zealand Institute for Plant and Food Research, PFR. Partnerships for Impactful Science. Given this 17th day of June 2021 at PHTRC CAPS, UP Los Banos, Laguna. Signed by Dr. Dormita R. Del Carmen, the director of PHTRC, and Dr. Elpidio Abdisit Jr., the dean of CAPS. So, again, ma'am, Dr. Ortiz, thank you very much for sharing your expertise and, of course, your time with us. And, Pleasure. Uh, this, uh, this has been a very interesting and also a fruitful discussion. And now to give uh, the uh, closing remarks, let me call on the PHTRC Extension Coordinator, Dr. Matilde Maunahan. Good morning po, Ma'am Deng. Good morning. A pleasant good morning to all. Thanks for uh, joining everyone. Thank you for joining us here in the second episode of the PHTRC Fresh Talks webinar series. Today's presentation is but a fitting contribution to the International Year of Fruits and Vegetables 2021, that of promoting awareness about the importance of fruits and vegetables, particularly about an institution, which is the PFR, and how its technologies and partnerships created impact on the horticulture development, not only in New Zealand, but also in other countries. Our special thanks again to our alumna, colleague and friend, Dr. Ging Ortiz and her institution, the PFR, for sparing us time and effort to share with us their experience and best practices in bringing to and creating the fruits of research and co-innovation with the stakeholders themselves. To make all these, uh, these things possible, the PFR, as one of the seven Crown Research Institutes, evolved as a business model. We can draw inspiration in PFR's a Smart Green Futures Three Elements Strategy of investing in world-class science, applying this for maximum value, and sharing this value to those who contributed to its creation for business sustainability. The PFR boasts of a critical mass of experts, and we take pride in having 15 Filipinos, three of whom are UPLB alumni, in that elite group. We marvel at the bulk of resources, 63% of their funding, that they get from royalties and commercial sources. Theirs is science with a market insight, one that we at the academy could draw lessons and examples from in line with our continued efforts as a research university. Successful partnerships with the kiwi fruit industry and even with the dragon fruit sector in Vietnam showed how far research and science can go to widen an R&D institution's experience, diversify its revenues and expand its brand profile, but most importantly, to make things happen for the better of the farming communities. Again, Thanks, Dr. Ortiz and PFR, and we hope for more fruitful collaborations with you in the near future. To all who joined us this morning from across Asia and elsewhere in the globe, thanks for participating actively in the webinar, and we hope to see and have more of you in our future events. Just stay tuned via our Facebook page for updates. So have a safe and nice day, everyone. And from the Philippines, mabuhay and salamat po sa lahat. Thank you po, Dr. Maunahan, for that uh, 
very well said, closing remarks, and to quote, we can draw in inspiration from the best practices at CFR. And uh, we, we might ask, or some of these uh, models might fit the situation here in the Philippines. And uh, but we are really uh, proud of um, having uh, Filipino scientists that are working <laughs> and raising the Filipino flag for research. <laughs> and of course, to our participants, we hope that you bring with you the learnings you have gained from this episode. And just a reminder for everyone, kindly fill out the evaluation form for you to receive the e-certificate. The link is now shared on your screen and also posted in the YouTube comment section. So please type in your browsers the link or you may scan the QR code on the screen. So. Uh, we will open the evaluation form until uh, June 21, that's Monday next week, until 5 p.m. And you will receive the certificate after five working days. So for future announcements of a post of PHTRC activities, please like the official Facebook page of PHTRC. PHTRC. Again, thank you, Dr. Ortiz, for sharing your time and expertise with us. And we would also like to acknowledge the hard work of the people behind this webinar series. So shout out to the PHTRC's extension committee and all the staff. So thank you everyone. Again, thank you for attending this webinar and please stay tuned for the rest of, or for the next activities of PHTRC. This has been Zandriel Zuniega. Until next time, hanggang sa, mga, hanggang sa muli mga kapreshness, stay safe everyone. Thank you, Dr. Ortiz. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.